get back to the trials and tribulations of the Red Guards. Mao is not stupid, but he is badly advised. Mrs. Mao, trying as usual to out Mao Mao, decides to launch an anti zhou Enlai campaign. She unleashes Yao Tung Chen, a complete fool against the citadel of the astute bureaucrats of the Foreign Affairs Ministry. Official target, Foreign Minister Chen Yi. Real target, Zhou Enlai. Mrs. Mao gets her red guards to put the torch to the British Embassy. Embarrassing the British, though, is less important to her than sabotaging Zhou Enlai and his foreign policy. And poor Chen Yi is caught in the crossfire. It's the same story with the uproar over Antonioni's film on China, a film few Chinese have ever seen that millions never will see. The only purpose of all the shouting is to screw up China's embassies abroad. And should this film ever be attacked from official quarters, you may be sure that the reasons will have nothing to do with the film itself. It will be because a bunch of unreconstructed Maoist bureaucrats in China are trying to use us as a stick with which to beat some of our friends. Zhou <laughs> Enlai has been taking his punishment lying down for over a year. But this time he loses his cool and allies himself with the non-Linbiaoist factions of the military. These elements want three things, but fast. Number one, they want production to resume. Number two, they want the Red Guard smashed. Number three, they want Lin Biao's ass, because they see his rise as a threat to themselves. We are at the great watershed of the Cultural Revolution. Chen Zetao, garrison commander of the Wuhan industrial sector, has lent his support to an anti-Red Guard factory workers organization called the Million Warriors. Remember, everyone is a Maoist, but everyone is throwing punches, and no one quite knows which way the shit will fly next. July 20th, 1967. Wang Li, a young ideologue whose head has gotten too large for his Mao hat, and Si Fu Chi, national police chief, come down to Wuhan from Peking to straighten things out for the Mrs. Maoists. As soon as they arrive, they are arrested, paraded through the streets, beaten, subjected to mass criticism. In short, given a strong dose of their own medicine. Wong Li returns to Peking in the now traditional plaster casts. And, oh, irony of fate, he and Si Fu Chi owe their liberation and no doubt their lives to Zhou Enlai. Wong Li has a hard time living down the Wuhan incident. He remains a pain in the ass to the foreign affairs people for a while, but in the end, Mao has to let him go. Chen Saitao's example fills the other provincial military leaders with enthusiasm, and their newfound energy enables them to accomplish goals one and two of their program, if not, for the moment, goal three, which is to put the chill on Nin Biao. Goal one, the resumption of production, is carried through under the grandiose banner of the Triple Alliances, and entails the direct military control of all key posts in both factories and the civil service. As for goal two, the Red Guards are packed off to the countryside, notably to Chinese Turkestan, and put to work growing melons. Any complaints and the troublesome parties are shot on the spot. What the campaign for the Triple Alliances boils down to is a struggle within the military. It's the Mrs. Maoist, or Lin Biaois versus the rest. Mao is up Shit's Creek without a paddle. He accedes to the demobilization of the Red Guards to whom he owes so much. He claims to have a, quote, strategic plan, unquote. But this strategic plan has much in common with Nixon's during the last days of Watergate. We should be getting to know them by now. Mao Zedong, our red, red leader, the red sun that thrills our hearts, the great helmsman, blah, blah, blah. And there is Lin Biao, AKA Mao's closest comrade in arms, editor of the Little Red Book and the Supreme Little Manual. The chamber is decorated, no, not in red, white, and blue, but in a fine Lin Biao khaki. Too bad that this sequence is in black and white, but you can take it from us that all our actors are in green. 
Imagine the U.S. Congress with all its members in olive drab. The anti-Maoists in the military are about to lose their advantage because they fail to realize their common interest vis-a-vis -vis Lin Biao. And Mao is not about to miss the trick. We are at the Ninth Party Congress. Here we see Mao a little doubtful. He is not sure that the headway made by Lin Biao at the Congress may not in the long run be turned against him. Statues of the Chinese Communist Party. Comrade Lin Biao has always held aloft the great red flag of Mao Zedong thought. He steadfastly applies and defends with the greatest loyalty and firmness the proletarian revolutionary line of Comrade Mao Zedong. Comrade Lin Biao is the close comrade in arms and successor of Comrade Mao Zedong. How complicated life is in the bureaucracy. Here is Lin Biao in his moment of triumph, yet his fate is already sealed. He is about to be nominated, or to nominate himself, Mao's official successor. Yet three months before this, with Mao's ascent, Zhou Enlai has asked Chen Zilian, chief of the Shenyang military region, which comprises the three northwestern provinces bordering on the Soviet Union, to react with unusual vigor to the next Russian provocation on the Ussuri River. There is an island on the Ussuri called Chenpao. The Russians insist on calling it Damansky because the millions of square miles of territory they stole from the Manchu Empire at the time of the unequal treaties is not enough for them. And they make a point of occupying the island six months out of every year. The other half of the year, by the way, the island is underwater. Consequently, Chen Bao is often the scene of skirmishes between Chinese fishermen and Soviet border police. Chen Zilian has his instructions and doesn't need anyone to hold his hand. He conscientiously films these Chinese fishermen being massacred by the Russians. I dare say you're wondering why, instead of a camera, he didn't have a bazooka. Well, you've guessed it. These gruesome pictures are intended to put the Chinese people in an uproar and cut the ground from under Lin Biao's feet as he works for detente with the USSR. So Lin Biao gets a brick through his window. But there's more to it than this. You have just witnessed the inception of ping-pong diplomacy on the Sino-Soviet border. which doesn't prevent Zhou Enlai, the very day after these events, from explaining to Kasigan, who happens to be passing through Peking, that the incident is not supposed to have any sequel. Perhaps you think this is a far-fetched theory. Yeah! A little quiet, please. It isn't our first far-fetched theory, but you must admit that we haven't often been wrong. and fall of Lin Biao and his system, let's take a little trip back in time and look at a period in Chinese history that was anything but happy. Here, in the words of some ex-Red Guards of Canton, we give you the Lin Biao era. Politics was the watchword in every sphere. 
a watchword designed to reward apathy and punish enthusiasm? Can you remember the way we were supposed to study, study, day in and day out? Study? It was more like telling the rosary, repeating a litany, and the eternal meetings for study and application, pure hypocrisy, and all the talk about the revolution exploding in the depths of the soul. Not so much an explosion as a wet fart. Remember how important it was to display one's loyalty and perfect incitement to political opportunism. And you remember what was called the loyalty dance, that obscene quadrille of obedience. ritual. In the morning, prayers. In the evening, penitence. And meetings, rallies, changing shifts, making telephone calls, going shopping, writing letters, even eating meals. All were plunged into a pea soup of religiosity. Until everything began to stink of God. The magical word loyalty took up 100% of our time, 100% of our space. Everywhere it was the best this, the best that. And all the time, the only thing we heard was left, left. 